Welcome to the To Be The Church podcast, where we explore what it looks like to truly be the church in today's culture. I'm Tyler. This is Andrew. Hello. And guess who's back? It's Ben. Hello. It's been a while. Glad um, to be back. It's been a while. Yep. You ever heard that one? See what you did there? Yep, yep, yep. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you know that um, you can see us at least, and that we're in our auditorium here. Um we're sorry that we did not have an episode for you last week. We actually recorded an episode for you last week, mm-hmm. um, but we recorded it a week early, and it was on the situation in Afghanistan. And then there had been enough developments in that situation that we thought, like, this isn't helpful here nine days later. Um, so let's just cut this one, and then we'll come back next week and actually re-engage. And so as we're recording right now at about 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, this will come out Friday morning, uh, we, we figure we'll be fairly up to date on the scenario Um and as we were recording that last one, it was kind of still very much like what's going on, yeah. you know, what's happening. And uh, I, I actually told my wife that night, I said, hey, next Friday is the TBTC. Um, Andrew, like, I just said, Andrew, what's going on in Afghanistan? And you gave like a 20-year history, um, a short 20-year history of what's going on. And I actually found that like super helpful yeah. um, for this conversation because some people might not be super acclimated to it or some people might like – need the, uh, the reminder of what's been going on. So before we talk about the church in Afghanistan or how we can be the church uh, for the people of Afghanistan or for refugees or whatever, um, let's start there again. Um, you know, let's back up. What, like, where did this whole thing in Afghanistan start and, and where are we at today and fill in the blanks from, from here to there? Okay, yeah. So the uh, start in 2001, you guys remember 9-11, okay? So... Uh, shortly after 9-11, the United States invaded Afghanistan with the express intent of doing two things. Number one, killing Osama bin Laden. Remember that, Ben? Mm-hmm. And then number two, to also um, basically eliminate the context in Afghanistan where al-Qaeda, bin Laden, and that whole crew was able to foster like a massive terror network, right? So the Taliban at the time were, were, were the ruling party in Afghanistan. Um, I think 96 to 2001, it was only about a five-year period that the Taliban was in control, but they had created this, um, this basically this context where they looked past terror and those kind of things. And the reason the United States actually invaded uh, after 9-11 was because we told the Taliban, hey, turn over Osama bin Laden and the al-Qaeda key guys. And, you know, they said no, because they were pretty pretty well aligned with that whole world. So we went in there to get bin Laden. We went in there to, to eliminate the, the Taliban's leadership in Afghanistan. Um, and so, you know, fast forward 10 years after that, uh, I actually looked up this date today. May 2nd, 2011 was when we killed uh, bin Laden. Uh, we didn't kill him in Afghanistan. We killed him in Pakistan. But... Um, and, and around that time, this is right before uh, Obama's second turn, uh, around that time there, you know, about 10 years in that war, after we killed bin Laden, there started to be this kind of idea of like, okay, how much longer are we going to be in Afghanistan? Um, you guys, if you've been l- listening to the news, you, you might have heard the phrase uh, graveyard of empires. Have you heard that at all? Uh, Afghanistan's been kind of known as that over the years. Uh, in the 19th century, the Britons, you know, uh, British uh, they had a couple wars with Afghanistan. Uh, the Russians have had a lot of history in Afghanistan. And nobody's been able to really get that country into a different way of government beyond kind of this tribal infighting, right? So we're 10 years in. We kill bin Laden. Um, and then the American people began to kind of be like, okay, why are we in Afghanistan? To, to, uh, to, to, to allow our, pres- our troop presence to be there and be safe, um, we, we needed a pretty significant troop presence at the time. And so there were a couple things uh, from 2011 to 2014 where there were some surges of troop presence. And, um, and we, were, we set up like a democratic government, right, where um, there was, a, you know, American University in Afghanistan, uh, girls in Kabul, uh, the the capital city where we were we were set up and had a pretty good troop presence. We were able to start going to school. So there, our presence on the ground there had been a, a major um, bonus for human rights in the in the nation. And there was a very well at the time we all thought a kind of a fledgling democracy, but we didn't realize how fledgling that was until really the last couple of weeks. So. So fast forward, uh, 2014, um, Obama pulls the troops out of Iraq, and then the, the, the question began to be, like, how long are we going to be in Afghanistan? And so, uh, actually, Trump, when he ran in 2016, the first time, um, this was a pretty surprising thing, because from the right, 
Uh, Republicans gen generally are a little more hawkish on foreign policy, like like not uh, afraid to go to war. I mean, George W. Bush uh, famously, uh, you know, said stuff like, um, "We got to take the fight to them so that we don't, you know, get more terror on our on our side." And that was a pretty traditional Republican stance, right? Whereas the Democrats. Uh, traditionally would be a little more uh, isolationist and not as into the foreign policy thing. So so, um, so then what, what happens is uh, uh, Trump runs on that, gets elected, and there's really a bipartisan call to get our troops out of Afghanistan, right? And, and mainly because it was like, hey, we got to end this war. Hey, this is over. No more endless wars. And I, I want to say the percentage, it was like 75% of Americans polled um, over the last, let's say, five years have been for pulling our troops out, which is a pretty major, in, in a partisan environment that we're in, that's a pretty uh, pretty major stat there to have that many percentage of Americans like, hey, we just want to be done with this, right? So when, when Trump and Biden uh, uh, ran in 2020, they kind of were at a similar place on it, like we're going to pull the troops out, right? Trump in the last year or two of his term had um, his State Department, led by Mike Pompeo, had negotiated uh, with the Taliban uh, like a what, what was uh, called a conditional um, troop withdrawal. So they set a bunch of conditions for like, hey, we'll, we're going to withdraw our troops at this, you know, May 1st, 2021 was the deadline. We're going to withdraw our troops um, in May, uh, but this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. You can't do this. You can't do that. It was all conditions, right? Um, had Trump gotten reelected, I don't know that the troops would have been pulled, honestly, because from the right, um, the, the conditions were strong enough, and I don't think the Taliban were going were gonna to agree to that. But anyway, Biden gets elected, and he gets into office, and so um, he, he inherits that deal. He has, he has the power, any president has the power to, to um, uh, make different deals. I mean, every, when Biden got into office, he made uh, a record number of executive orders in his first uh, 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 week in, in, the, in, in the presidential office, overturning policies that Trump had done, you know, both um, domestically and, and, and internationally. But, uh, but Biden, you know, he went with it because it was a popular thing in America, like, hey, we want to pull our troops out. And so, um, but he decided to move the, uh, the deadline back from May to September 11th, right? Um, why he did that is not really known. Um, the, there's, a, there's a symbolism to it, right? Uh, a lot of people think it was kind of a political move. Hey, September 11th, 20 years later, we pull our troops out. It's a victorious thing, whatever. So, but what that allowed to happen was it gave uh, May, June, July, August, what's called the fighting season in the Middle East. Um, it gave them opportunity, the Taliban specifically, to kind of build more momentum. And so, although people are really, really aligned um, on, hey, we wanted this to end in Afghanistan, uh, at the end of the time, there were about 2,500 troops on the ground. What we realize now, in, in hindsight, is that it was basically a peacekeeping force that was keeping the uh, status quo in Afghanistan from blowing up. Uh, and so, uh, while while uh, while you know three quarters of Americans wanted the troops out, another poll came out just this last week uh, about the way the withdrawal has gone. And um, it was like an ABC News poll, I think. It was 85, 84, 85 percent of Americans did not like the way that it was happening. Like they wanted to leave troops on the ground until all of the Americans and all of the allies were out, right? And, um, and so, and I don't even know if that, I think that poll was even taken before the attack um, on last Friday that killed um, 13 of our service, service members. But so, yeah, it's, 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 it's been an interesting thing to watch because the, the Biden administration is, is basically, um, is basically saying, hey, everybody wanted this to happen. Like, everybody wanted this to come out. And so on their side of it, they're saying everybody wanted this and it was going to be like this anyway. The opponents uh, on the other side, which interestingly, I think in my entire lifetime, I was just thinking about this today. I don't think other than 9-11, I can remember a news story that um, both sides of the media were so aligned on, right? Uh, you, you know, you have like your conservative media and then you have your uh, your legacy media, which tends to lean pretty hard left, and and both sides of the media, I mean, every media channel, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, um, in the height of this whole thing, have been saying the same thing about it, right? And and uh, really hammering the Biden administration on it. And so um, it it's uh, it's interesting. He's been saying, hey, everybody wanted this out. 
But then what, what people have been saying is, hey, it's, it's not a matter of us getting out. It's how we got out. It's the fact that we gave up our Air Force bases, so we had to evacuate everybody on one runway in this tiny little Kabul airport, which um, didn't have the capacity to be defended, as we now find out, tragically, um, from terror attacks. So, so now um, the, uh, the, the Taliban, um, and in fact, there was a Washington, this is, this is the difference between this podcast and like two weeks ago when we recorded our first one. There was a Washington Post article that came out uh, just this last week on the negotiations between the Biden administration and the, um, and the Taliban. And uh, the Taliban had offered to let the Biden administration keep Kabul, like like secure Kabul with the true presence rather than the Taliban taking it over. And uh, Biden had said, no, like you guys go ahead, <laughs> you know. And so so the Taliban was supposed we were supposed to be working with the Taliban to like secure the airport and secure the evacuation of all, you know, um, all our people. But. But there are just so many numerous reports of um, whether it's Christians in Afghanistan or uh, Americans or American allies who are being even hunted down by the by the Taliban. And then the Taliban's kind of running a bit of a disinformation thing where they're acting like, no, this is just this ISIS K terrorist guys. But uh, I saw an article this last week, uh, Osama bin Laden's number two guy. Um, who was like the guy who co-founded Al Qaeda with Bin Laden years and years ago? Um, he's back in Afghanistan now. There's been um, there's been video of him in, in a major city in Afghanistan. It's been all over the the press reports in America. So it's a it's a really uh, we're 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 out now. Our troops are out. Um, there's still a number of American citizens. Uh, State Department says low hundreds to 300. Um, I heard a report yesterday that it could be as many as 500. Um, and then there's thousands upon thousands of um, green card holders uh, and uh, and Afghans who worked with the American government who are basically sitting ducks now um, for the Taliban to uh, to eliminate them. And um, and and but now not only are troops out, most of our press is out as well. So even the stuff you're going to see, there's some stuff in the British press and the European press where you can kind of see some updates of this kind of stuff. But there's not even going to be a lot of like uh, clarity for what's going on now that now that our presence is out of there. So, um, so yeah, those troops were killed. Uh, the American troops were killed. The Biden administration responded by doing some drone attacks. Um, they claim to have gotten a couple ISIS K guys through that, um, but they don't want to commit any more troops. Obviously, no one wants really troops there now. So, the yeah, the long and short of it is now we've we've basically turned Afghanistan back over to the Taliban. Um, they have more um, they have more uh, presence and more uh, power in the country than they even had pre um, 20, 2001, 20 years ago. They they rule more of the uh, of the nation and they now have uh, as uh, I've heard different estimates. Some on the low side, people say it's twenty to thirty billion dollars. The number you see more is 80 to 85 billion dollars worth of American um, made. Uh, it's like a it's like an Iron Man thing, right? Where they like take all the American made stuff and like shoot shoot people with it. But um, uh, that's a movie. That's a yeah. yep. Seen it. Yep. yep. So uh, so they have American made military equipment um, to the tune of like nearly 100 billion dollars, and that was stuff that we had we had produced and given to the Afghan military. But the Afghan military and their president basically collapsed uh, real, real quickly. Um, and so, yeah, it's still developing, dude. There's there's reports out now that there was a phone call between Biden and the uh, president of Afghanistan, um, the guy who fled, you know, right when the Taliban were coming into Kabul, um, where, where Biden tells him to, um, hey, I know it's bad, but just kind of project that it's not bad because we need it to not look bad. And so that's been the latest thing in the last few days. It's kind of blown up in the press is like, is this going to be an impeachable thing or whatever else? And I don't, it won't be the, the, there's no appetite for more impeachment. So um, Biden won't get impeached over it, but, but it, it's a, uh, yeah, it's dicey, man. It's a, it's a horrible situation on the ground, particularly in Afghanistan for the Afghan people, for Christians in Afghanistan, for anybody who's not, um, who's, uh, who's aligned with America at all over there. And yeah, that uh, was my next yeah. question is what does life look like on the ground? Like what, like we hear a lot about human rights violations happening under the Taliban's rule. What does that actually look like? Yeah, well, there's, um, they, they call it forced marriage is one of the big things, um, in that, in uh, that, that they do. But, uh, what they basically mean is they kidnap, girls, you know, young teens, usually 12, 13, 14 years old, and force, force them to be married, which means force them to be um, raped uh, by the, um, 
you know, and, and, and by the by the uh, the ruling power and whatever else. And so you've already seen women's rights. You've already seen um, a lot of human rights type things occurring. Um, uh, we've got so many reports. You and I, we've all seen this through Twitter of, of um, uh, missionaries over there, Christians over there who are. Um, who, who they're coming after now, who are either going into hiding or they're, or they're going to be martyred uh, by the Taliban. And now that there's no accountability to them, they can, they can uh, set that up. So, um, yeah, and, and there's, there's a little bit of like, a, you know, there, there, there's like this idea, which is I'm probably not even worth mentioning, but there's this idea from the Biden administration that like, well, Afghanistan, if they want to join the community of nations, then they need to act like a, like, you know, everybody wants them to act. And it's like, it's nice and idealistic and utopian, but it's not realistic. Right. And, um, and that would be the major criticism of, of foreign policy, specifically from the left side of the aisle in America is that the kind of utopian ideals don't, you square when you get to like terrorism in the Middle East. And we saw that with the rise of ISIS after we took troops out of Iraq. We see that now with what's going on in Afghanistan. So yeah, we got to pray for the Christians there. Um, there are a lot of different um, organizations now that have popped up that are actually uh, smuggling people out. Um, and, uh, and so you can research those, you know, um, I heard the Nazarene project was one that had gotten like 5,500 people out, Christians from Afghanistan. So you might look that up and just vet it yourself. I mean, we're not like recommending that, but, but, um, you know, there's, uh, there's this huge group of, uh, ex, uh, special forces, uh, groups that are, um, I heard an interview with a guy yesterday that, uh, that they are still operating near the borders and they're smuggling Afghan comrades and, 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 and American citizens out as well. So it's, it's a mess, man. It's about as big of a mess. Um, as I think we've seen, um, I, I can't remember anything in the last like 15 to 20 years that was, that was kind of this big on the international stage. Uh, our European allies have, um, uh, I heard, I heard this one thing that from the first time since maybe even, you know, the 19th century, the British parliament, um, censured uh, the American president, um, uh, and they they passed a censure against Joe Biden, saying like you have absolutely left um, your European allies out to dry here, and so it's it's being spun all sorts of ways, and people are weaponizing it in a partisan way. But I think it's important as Christians to understand what's going on on the ground, the history of it. It, it was a very bipartisan thing to to get removed. It's just how it happened. Uh, under the current administration that, that's been problematic. And could have it happened any different? We don't know. There's no way to go back in history and, and really um, shift that around. But um, uh, as people are from different sides are trying to use it to, um, in a partisan way, I think as Christians, we got to pray. We got to become aware uh, of these things, learn. I, I think this is a good thing to observe and learn, uh, learn foreign policy, learn the history in these things. And then as we pray, Realize too, there are um, thousands of refugees from Afghanistan now being being brought into America. Uh, I, I saw a thing today that 5,000 landed in Indiana. Uh, yesterday, there was a big group that landed in Texas. And so, wherever you're at listening to this, you know, be aware of the situation on the ground and realize that like there will be refugees brought in. And so, there's lots of different ways to um, work to reach those refugee communities and to be the church toward them. And so I think, I think it's important to be aware of that as well, depending on where you live, you know, and, and what the, what the situation is, but yeah, quite the, quite the deal. Yeah. Um, so a few follow-up questions, um, you know, how should we as the church in America be praying for the whole scenario? And, and, you know, um, I, I actually, I'll put it in the show notes, but Gospel Coalition has a great article, it's super long, about like how to pray for Afghan Christians, mm. how to pray for the Taliban, <laughs> like how to pray yep. for um, you know all those involved, and, and it's really helpful. We read it with our kids um, over the course of like five nights, mm. um, just like the different elements of it. Um, really good there, but you know, how, how would you? How, first, how should we pray, and then what else can we do? Like we have a lady here in our church who's like on the phone all day. Um, like smuggling people, like attempting to smuggle people out, like mm -hmm. because of her missionary connections there. Yeah, and it's like not all of us have that opportunity. Sure. And so, first, how how can we pray? Second, how can we act? That's good, Ben. You got any thoughts on how we can pray? Yeah, I was trying to look uh, in my Bible reading plan a day or two ago. Um, and I'm in Isaiah. I don't know if I'm able to find the exact reference, but. 
Um, I was encouraged as I was praying that morning for Afghanistan, like uh, the, the it was talking about how all of these these uh, rulers and nations are kind of rising up and wreaking havoc. Um, but God through Isaiah is, is pretty much, you know, almost mocking them like he's in control. Right. And he's running history. And to me, that just gave uh, comfort. And it's what I was praying for Christians in Afghanistan, that they would realize who who is really on the throne mm-hmm. and God's in control and his promises are, are you know, his plan is still coming to fruition. Um, and I was just thankful. I, I think when you see all this chaos of a broken world, it's like, man, this is so messed up. But to be reminded that like throughout history, and this is not to downplay what's going on right now, but throughout history, there's always been evil rulers and evil people groups that have persecuted not just Christians, but other peoples. And, um, but we, we hold to this promise, um, that ultimately we see with Jesus being persecuted and murdered that, Although people, evil people do evil things, God is working in those same things with different intent, Mm -hmm. good intent, uh, intent that is uh, uh, redemptive and a part of his plan. So um, I don't throw those things out too quickly because, you know, obviously, if you're a Christian in Afghanistan, like you wouldn't want to just uh, just blank oh god's in control it's going to be okay you know what i mean yeah. because i i don't want to assume that i know what it's like to not know if you're going to be awake the next or be alive the next day um but if we kind of zoom back big picture like i think that's super comforting that god is still working all things together for good and i just think of that genesis 50 with joseph like mm-hmm. what they intended for evil obviously what the taliban is doing is intended for evil god is intending that same thing in a way that's way beyond our comprehension for good. And um, I think we can rest in that sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, yeah, just praying for the Christians, obviously that they'd be able to be rescued and get out of there and be safe. Um, And, and also I've been praying for them for boldness, you know, like Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I think it was Tertullian or some early apostolic father uh, said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, Mm -hmm. right? Like, Mm -hmm. The worst thing they can do to us is kill us, but even that draws people to to the Lord, and um, and death has lost its sting because of the gospel. Yeah. So the worst thing that can happen to us or any, anyone, any Christian, any part of the world, is death. But death has lost its sting because of Christ. And so um, I've been praying that the Afghan uh, Christians would just those promises of to depart from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, would just be something that they cherish because. If they don't make it, they're going to instantly be with Jesus, and that's far better. So, yeah, yeah. but again, I, I say all that with sensitivity of like I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm always cautious when people are suffering just to throw out these kind of theological, biblical answers in a way that's not sensitive to like it's really hard, and you know, it's not just a throwaway like oh God's in control or you know you're going to go to heaven anyway. Like that can be insensitive. So, but those are truths that we cling to. So, kind of balancing that. Yeah, and I think the, and like you said, the boldness for the Afghan Christians, uh, persecution historically throughout church history has been a major um, fuel for the church um, and the gospel expanding. And so uh, that that those, I mean, how many stories have we read over the years, whether it's these martyr stories or other things where where these, these uh, a death of a Christian, martyrdom of Christians has been a seed that those who even put them to death have come to Christ, right? And so, so I think we're, we're going to, and it, it, we're not going to know most of that till eternity, but it's like to pray for that and then to pray on a practical level of like the, the, um, that evil would be pushed back. That I think yeah. a First Timothy 2 has been one that I've been praying and that we've been praying as a family uh, that we're praying for leaders and all those in high positions, you know, that they would um, act in um, just ways, in good ways, that they would uh, uh, promote the good and punish every, every form of evil. Um, I mean, I prayed for Biden and, and those uh, in his administration a lot through this time. Um, foreign policy like this is something that the executive branch um, has more kind of plenary power over. So this is not necessarily like a all of government. It's more like the decisions that that the executive makes um, and then executes through the secretary of state and his cabinet officers. And so they have a lot of power in these decisions and, um, and praying for, 
for there to be wisdom, for there to be truth, for there to be um, good, just uh, uh, responses to things. And um, yeah, and then another dude, another practical way I thought of as well is um, there's been a massive uh, uh, influx of... um, uh, uh, th- this situation has made a massive impact on veterans of the Afghan war. And so for mm. 20 years, I mean, we have a number of veterans, veterans in our church from the Afghanistan war, whether it's special forces or some branch of the military and uh, parents of people who have enlisted uh, uh, sons and daughters in the military. And I mean, we have dozens, if not hundreds, probably in our church that that affects and there's been a massive uptick in um, like the veteran suicide hotlines uh, of, of like on a day to day basis in the last like month. It has just their, their call volume and stuff through the VA has just gone nuts. Right. Because there are people who ha- I mean, you're there fighting in that. And there there are a few thousand Americans over the 20 years that were killed. And so if you're over there and you lost uh, a close friend or a comrade in in uh, in battle and then you see this withdrawal and this is for all intents and purposes i mean it's it's um it's been a defeat right um uh to to for it to end and for the the same people who were in place in 2001 now to have more power more military equipment and more capability um than even when we got there 20 years ago it's been a very disillusioning thing for veterans and so that's where it's on a practical level if you if you know a veteran um uh, in your church or, or friends of yours family members to be reaching out to them to be walking through this as a as uh, as a part of the church together and um and and then if you are a, a veteran and you're going through those type of things to seek uh help within the community of of the church and to um and to and to speak up and to you know, not, not suffer alone in, in this regard. Cause that's been a real, the mental health stuff. It's been a real thing that you've seen, um, over the last, uh, probably month to six weeks as this has really been going on PTSD, all that stuff. So, so that would be another way to kind of walk with people that are in that, that situation as well. So. Yeah. It was mentioned a bit earlier, but you know, knowing that there are a lot of refugees on their way to America yep. that are landing now in different, different regions. If you are in one of those regions, um, scripture has a lot to say on how to care for the refugee in our midst. And, uh, um, that's a, a very practical way to be the church, yeah. um, whether it be bringing them into your home or, um, you know, assisting with the nonprofits and organizations that are bringing them in, um, even just being a smiling face at one of the centers. Um, in my hometown, there was a, a refugee center um, um, after I moved away, but my brother-in-law was fairly involved there. And it wasn't Afghan refugees, but um, it was... Um, actually Congolese refugees, which is where my son's from. Um, And so my brother-in-law was telling me about the stories of just like how encouraged um, the refugees have been just by family showing up and just having a conversation with them, just sitting and talking even through an interpreter, the smiles and stuff like that has has made a big difference. Yeah. Um, Any final thoughts before we, uh, before we wrap this up? I don't know. This is probably for another uh, episode, but um I'm preaching Psalm 4 this Sunday, and uh, there's a line in there uh, in Psalm 4 that I've been pondering, uh, be angry and do not sin. Mm. I'm, just, I'm just processing as Christians, when we see something that is clearly like this, that is evil, that is unjust, what does it look like to be angry and not sin? Mm. Are we responding rightly, you know, and yeah. even thinking how we're dialoguing or processing these things as Christians on social media and different things, um, it, it was making me think of your sermon from last Sunday of like meeting unrighteousness or yeah, unrighteousness with more unrighteousness, right? Yeah, like that mm-hmm. revenge that, um, I don't know. So maybe that's uh, another episode, but this kind of has me thinking about that as like, we should be angry at what's happening to Christians and people in Afghanistan. What does it look like to be angry and not sin? Um, I don't have an answer, but I've been pondering that today. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. And that's a good note, I, I think, to end on too, because I, I do think it it is a. Uh, it, and again, I I, I am um, I, I spend as much of my own personal time reading on politics and listening to this kind of stuff as anybody else I know. And like there's, so I get to witness a lot of Christians in the public sphere, and a lot of us do on Twitter and stuff. But but responding to this kind of stuff. And this is an opportunity where you can spend more time in prayer. And there's if time is finite, right? You only have a certain amount of time. So you can spend more time in prayer or you can spend more time maybe on social media or other things 
um, you know, uh, uh, trying to score kind of partisan political points. And I just, it's like, I, and I, I, I try to stay out of that, you know, politics on social media anyway, because I don't see a whole, a whole lot of a purpose to it. I think it's, I, I still cannot, and maybe if that's your job, maybe, but it's just like, I don't, I don't see as a normal Christian what the purpose is of doing it that way, right? Um, but, but yeah, to spend more time in prayer than you would, um, you know, uh, uh, one of our friends, uh, uh, Drew Dick, who we had on the podcast this summer, he's preached at our church. Um, I follow him on Twitter because he's hilarious, but also um, he just, he's a Canadian guy, you know, so he just has a way of like, he can comment on stuff in America and not be super partisan about it, but he, he said at one point, like two or three weeks ago, when the stuff was first really breaking out, he's like, man, the part, partisan politics is a dangerous drug, you know, mm-hmm. because it was one of those things that's like so many, there's so many obvious things going on. And, and like the way that people so quickly retreat into their corners and then just, just literally regurgitate very clear talking points from whatever specific channel they're on or, or podcast they follow it's just very, it's, it's tired. It's divisive. I, I don't see the point to it. it. Be informed, but let it inform your prayers. Let it inform the way that you be the church with people around you. And so there's a lot of ways that we can sin in that regard with slander, with, you know, I mean, when, when reviled, Jesus didn't revile in return first Peter four, you know? So, so when we're angry and we feel that like to not revile, to not, you know, uh, uh, do that. Well, the I next line in right. Psalm four is ponder these things on your bed and be silent mm. yeah. <laughs> and offer right <laughs> sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Wow. And so it's like, yeah. I, again, I, I just finished the sermon this morning. So I've been pondering, trying to apply it. Like, mm. what does it look like to be quiet? Cause he's not saying we repress and don't speak up for justice, but like, I don't know. It's, it's a thing to wrestle with. That's great, dude. Psalm four. Yeah, well, perhaps this is a uh, raise questions that you would like to present to us, or maybe you have thoughts on this. We'd love to hear from you. Or maybe you want to uh, say, I would like to hear Andrew's uh, recollection of this historical event, or, this, or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> There's a new podcast, I think, right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That no um, one wants to listen to. <laughs> no, I, I legitimately... history with Andrew. <laughs> I legitimately told Katie the night we recorded that last, and I was like, oh, it was like super helpful. Um, so podcast at tobethechurch.com is the place to reach out and ask those questions or make those suggestions. Um, you can also do that on social media, at to be the church. Tweet us um, about your questions rather than tweeting political nonsense to each other. Um, But until next week, uh, be the church.